darling. I hope you're tucked up in a nice warm bed. High on Everest, in the death zone. With little hope of rescue, a climber contacts his wife. We're looking forward to looking after you when you get home. Because they will find you. Try not to worry too much. Seven lives have already been lost in Mount Everest's deadliest storm. Disasters don't just happen. They're triggered by a chain of critical events. Unravel the clues and count down those final seconds from disaster. Nepal. Mount Everest. May the 9th, 1996. 10.15 p.m. Climbers from two commercial expeditions prepare to leave Camp 4, the highest camp on the mountain. The teams have spent four weeks ascending from Everest Base Camp. From Camp 4, they will launch their final assault on the 8,850 meter peak. Neil Beidelman is a guide for the commercial climbing company Mountain Madness. I stuck my head outside the tent and it was, it was very cold, but it was clear and the winds were calm. Just before midnight, we put our crampons on and I helped our clients get ready. Fourteen client climbers are making a bid for the world's highest peak. Led by six professional guides. Lou Kaczyski is a client with another company, Adventure Consultants. All of your mental and physical strength is focused on your next step. Nothing else matters. It doesn't matter that you're dehydrated. It doesn't matter that you're malnourished. It doesn't matter that you're starved for oxygen. Sheer will is taking you to the summit. Five thirty a.m. Lena Gamelgard is a Mountain Madness client. I felt excited, scared. I doubted myself. I wanted to test myself against this grandiose fantasy of becoming an, an Everest uh, mountaineer that was capable of, of surviving. Above eight thousand meters. The climbers have now entered the death zone, where the air is too thin to support human life. I knew that if I make the slightest mistake here, I am going to die. If you twist your ankle, if you uh, get a little bit lost from the main route, you are dying as you climb higher because there's not enough oxygen to sustain yourself. Mountain Madness leader Scott Fisher is at the rear of his group to help slower climbers. Adventure Consultants leader Rob Hall adopts the same role for his team. Bob had climbed Everest seven times before. He was an expert and we were engaging him for his leadership. For the lead climbers, the ascent begins to get more technical. Neil Beidelman, one of Scott Fisher's guides, has to fix ropes up to the south summit, 100 meters below the main Everest peak. 9.58 a.m. I fixed all the ropes that I had 
and I arrived at the top of the South Summit. It was then that I had a realization that the faster people might be able to make it to the top, but probably not everybody. The teams had planned to summit by 1 p.m. in order to descend before nightfall. But climbers waiting to use the ropes have begun bunching up. Speed is safety in the mountains. I was waiting and realizing that, oh, this is, this is going to slow us down, this is going to slow us down, this is absolutely not good. Most of the climbers have now made it to the top of the south summit. Ahead of them is the southeast ridge and Hillary Step. Again, the trail needs fixing with ropes. But one of the Sherpas assigned this role hasn't reached the south summit. Guides Neil Beidelman and Anatoly Bukriev need to make a decision. I looked at Anatoly and said, look, if anybody's going to summit today, we've got to do this, and we've got to do it right now. The two guides start fixing the ropes. The leading client climbers traverse the southeast ridge. Below them, Luka Shishke is still climbing the south summit. He knows the team are behind schedule. I had promised my wife Sandy one attempt only on Everest. This was it, and to come back home. Looking up, I see the people moving ahead. The only voice within me at that point was, they're going, I'm going. And I continued to move up. All of a sudden, I dropped down to my knees and I'm hanging on to the ice axe. Everything went silent. Stone silent. I began to hear another voice. I believe it was the voice of the heart. And I even think it might have been Sandy's heart crying out to be heard. I looked up at the top because I wanted to visualize me standing on top of Everest. A moment that was never going to happen in a place that I was never going to stand. Lou Kashishke turns around and heads back to Camp 4. Above, Beidelman and Bukhriev reach the notorious Hillary Step, the only remaining obstacle between them and the summit. It's another section that needs roping. Bukhriev sets off first. He climbed to the top of the Hillary Step using some of the old ropes that were there and an ice axe. Climbers wait to ascend. The Hillary step was a bottleneck. I was aware that oh, we are so many people on the mountain, it is slowing us down. One oh seven PM. Above the Hillary step, Mukriev makes the short climb to the top of Everest. When I arrived on the top, we congratulated each other. Part of their role is to get summiting clients moving down the mountain quickly. 
But an hour later, Bukriev is starting to suffer. Banatoli came over to me and said that he was going to head down. And at first I was like, oh, I'd like to go down too. But there were still other clients that were not accounted for. 2.10 p.m. Whilst Mountain Madness leader Scott Fisher approaches the Hillary Step, Adventure Consultant leader Rob Hall summits. He radios base camp. It's cold and windy up here. If you don't hear from me again, it means everything's fine. Two thirty p.m. All the Mountain Madness clients reach the summit. But there's no sign of their leader, Scott Fisher. Neil Beidelman is now in sole charge of the group. Nobody was going to just touch the top and turn around in a minute. I just couldn't get people up fast enough to head back down. The Mountain Madness team begin their descent. Of the Hillary staff, the group have come across their expedition leader, Scott Fisher. He's still ascending. I was a little miffed when, when I passed him that he was so far behind. I really expected him to be with the team. The descending Mountain Madness group make their way down the upper sections of the mountain to reach the south summit. That's where I really, for the first time, had this sense of dread. Beidelman notices a marked change in the weather conditions below. I knew that we would be walking into, at minimum, a good squall. 16 hours into the climb, oxygen supplies are running low. Then, at the bottom of the south summit, one of the clients, Sandy Hill Pittman, collapses. She's given an emergency shot of a steroid, dexamethasone. And I go over there, and Sandy can barely talk. She's just kind of gurgling into her mask. And I looked at her tank, and she had a little bit of oxygen left, but it was getting near the end. I have to give all of my effort to get Sandy stood up and start to drag her off the mountain, otherwise she's dead. There's no question about that. The summit. 3.40 p.m. Mountain Madness leader Scott Fisher finally makes it. His lead Sherpa is waiting for him. We made it. Got on side. Get down the mountain, Scott. At the Hillary Step, adventure consultant leader Rob Hall is assisting an exhausted client, Doug Hansen, down. Mike Groom, one of the six guides, spots him. I look up to the Hillary step, and I remember doing this to, to Rob, and he responded. So I thought, okay, everything's okay. But 15 minutes later, Rob Hall radios base camp. We've run out of oxygen. I'm with Doug and he's collapsed above the Hillary Step. We need oxygen to be brought up from the South Summit. 800 meters above, Rob Hall is with Doug Hansen descending the Hillary Step.
and Scott Fisher with his head Sherpa are struggling down to the south summit. Below them, Mike Groom and Neil Beidelman are approaching the South Col when the storm finally strikes. 7 p.m. Winds are blowing fiercely. There's thunder and lightning in the sky now. It just, you know, the, they were almost instantaneous. It just, like, knocked you down. We're now really getting hammered by the wind and because of darkness and, and wind-driven snow and ice, we've lost all sense of direction, all visibility. Lena Gamelgaard is with them. Everybody had run out of oxygen at this point, and that's just like pulling the plug from the electricity. People are collapsing. None of us are capable of carrying those that have collapsed. On both sides of the South Call are two very steep precipices. And I just had this, this feeling, almost a premonition, that if we didn't just stop and regroup, that we were going to walk right off the edge. 10 p.m. The 11 climbers form a huddle. You sort of huddle together to uh, keep each other as warm and protected as possible and beat each other to help keep each other awake. That was pure survival. Keep moving your arms and legs! I don't want to die! I had to fight against the weight of just wanting to go to sleep and, and not wake up again. Then, for a brief moment, the clouds clear. What I saw was the outline of two peaks. This was the chance that we were looking for. This was our opportunity. Seeing the peaks gives the climbers a bearing. They set off towards Camp 4. But some are so exhausted they can hardly stand. If you can't walk, crawl! The guides decide to leave those that can't move behind. It did make sense, otherwise, we're all probably going to die. Stay together! Don't separate! I'll go and get help and bring it back! Groom and Beidelman struggle on with the climbers who can walk. We were the only ones at the, this point that were able to move. Five are left behind. We walked directly into where the camp was. tent door open and someone pulls me inside and I recall them breaking ice off around my face and throwing a couple of sleeping bags over the top of me and that's the last thing I remember. I was shaking so uncontrollably that it was clear that me going back out I'd be another victim. Lena Gamelgaard tells Anatoly Bukriev about the group they left behind. I explained to Anatoly, they're so close. You have to walk in that direction to find them. Bukriev heads off alone into the storm.
guides a barely conscious team member back to Camp 4. There was nobody except Anatoly who were capable of moving to help anybody up there. 3 a.m. Bukriev leads two more climbers to the camp. But he doesn't have the strength to rescue the remaining two clients. And at that point, Anatoly collapsed. There was nothing more in him. Six climbers from the two teams, including leaders Rob Hall and Scott Fisher, are still out on the mountain. They've been out there for over 24 hours. May the 11th, 1996. 365 meters above Camp 4, Sherpas try to rescue Scott Fisher. They found Scott barely breathing, not responding to anything, and felt that there was no way that they could get him back down. Sherpas attempt to reach Rob Hall on the south summit but they are forced to turn back 213 meters below his position due to worsening weather. He's still alive, but frostbitten and unable to descend. Base camp patch Rob Hall's radio through to his pregnant wife at home in New Zealand. Hey, darling. I hope you're tucked up in a nice warm bed. So much... So much better than I thought you would. How are your feet? I haven't taken my boots off to check, but I think I may have a bit of frostbite. We're looking forward to looking after you when you get home. Because they will find you. Try not to worry too much. Rob Hall is never heard from again. The storm that struck Mount Everest on May the 10th, 1996, claimed eight lives. Adventure consultant's client Doug Hansen and guide Andy Harris died above the south summit. From the same team, Japanese climber Yasuko Namba died at the site of the huddle. Despite spending the entire night of the storm exposed on the South Col, client Beck Weathers survived. But he suffered severe frostbite that would cost him his right hand and nose. Leader Rob Hall's body was found below the south summit on May the 23rd. Scott Fisher, Mountain Madness team leader, finally died alone just above the south call. Three climbers from an expedition on the north face also died that night. It was the worst single disaster in Mount Everest's history. As news of the tragedy traveled around the world, people wanted to know how so many climbers could die in a single day. Now, by rewinding the events and examining the evidence, we reveal why disaster was inevitable and how two leaders as experienced and able as Rob Hall and Scott Fisher could end up 
in such a death trap. Alan Hinks is one of the few elite mountaineers to have summited all 14 mountains in the world that are over 8,000 meters above sea level. Everest, the highest of them all, is 8,850 meters. Above 8,000 meters, it's, uh, it's like another world. It's a bit like you're suffering from flu and you've got a hangover and you're trying to push yourself on a marathon. Everything takes a massive amount of effort, just thinking, just moving. On May the 9th, 1996, Alan Hinks was part of a British expedition on the north side of Everest. They were forced to postpone their summit bid when the storm struck. Alan Hinks believes that the disaster on the other side of the mountain was caused by a series of fatal miscalculations. In 96, there was critical decisions made on Everest. Some were right, some were wrong. All attempts on high summits have a cutoff time. A time to turn around and head back down the mountain. Everest's accepted cutoff time is 1 p.m. Head for Camp 4 any later than that, and the risks begin to multiply. Turnaround times are important because you're going to get more exhausted and you're going to run out of bottled oxygen. Delaying the descent beyond 1 p.m. also means returning in the dark. You can't see properly, even with a head torch on. And it's just adding to the, to the disorientation with the fatigue at extreme altitude. On Everest, late in the day, the weather is also likely to rapidly deteriorate. Once it gets dark, it gets much, much colder. 40 below is quite possible. And if it's in a storm with the wind, you could easily get minus 60. And it's just stripping the life out of your body. So you must have a turnaround time and stick to it. Before the 1996 ascent, both groups discussed a turnaround time of 1 p.m. We need to be on the ridge at daybreak. We need to be on the south summit by 10 or earlier, and on the summit by 12. Absolute drop-dead time was, was 1 o'clock. That wasn't our target time that we wanted to be leaving the summit. That was the, the maximum, the latest in the day. But at 1 p.m. on May the 10th, not a single climber from either expedition had reached the summit of Mount Everest. It's not until 4 p.m. that the final two climbers reach the top. One of them is Rob Hall, the adventure consultant's leader who had initially set the 1 p.m. deadline. Alan Hinks wants to understand why these delays in getting to the summit happened. The biggest delay on the ascent had been because of bottlenecks at two sections of the climb, below the south summit and on the Hillary step. These are the most technically demanding parts of the climb and require fixed ropes. Fixed ropes are necessary on Everest to make sure people can get up, but more importantly, get down safely. Clearly, someone has to go first and fix the ropes on the steep sections. As the clients arrived at the bottom of the south summit, no ropes had been fixed. The plan was for Lobsong, our head climbing Sherpa, and Rob's head climbing Sherpa, to leave the tents two hours before us to enable them enough time to get the ropes in place. But as the climbers waited, Weidelman found Sherpa Lopsang showing signs of altitude sickness. There was Lopsang sitting with his elbows on his knees and he was vomiting. So I reached into Lopsang's pack and I grabbed all the ropes that he had. Lopsang never was able to recover and come to the front of the group and to start fixing ropes. Alan Hinks believes that the rope fixing failure shows the plan itself was flawed. Sending two Sherpas up to fix the ropes, you know, a couple of hours before everybody went to the summit is, is cutting it fine. 
one or both of those people are affected dramatically by the conditions, then that's the end of fixing the ropes. Guides Anatoly Bukriev and Neil Beidelman eventually took responsibility for fixing ropes. But climbers from both teams were forced to wait as they worked. Nowadays, to, to help reduce the delays on Everest, you'd, you'd send a team ahead to make sure the mount's fixed before anyone sets off. And you'd also have at least two ropes, a rope for going up and a rope for coming down. But in 1996, even had the ropes been set earlier, with 33 climbers attempting to summit, queues would still have formed. The decision for the two largest expeditions that year to attempt to summit on the same day was controversial even at the time. The rationale that was put forward was that the mountain hadn't been climbed that year, there was very deep snow. By combining forces, we'd have more Sherpa and guide support. At one point, Rob said that, well, there would be some strength in numbers, but that didn't make any sense because more numbers means more complexity, more complexity means more things can go wrong. Two teams joining forces not only added to the delays, it also altered the stakes for both leaders. Although good friends, the two expedition leaders were in competition in the new game of commercial expeditions on Everest. There probably would have been a bit of pressure rivalry between the two expeditions. I mean, that's only human nature. Adventure Consultants was set up by Rob Hall in 1992. The company pioneered the commercial expedition model, where professional climbers get paying clients up the mountain. One of the better word, Rob, is the market leader on Everest. Everybody respected him. Scott Fisher was the new kid on the block, a charismatic, charming leader with movie star looks. 1996 was his first commercial attempt on Everest. Scott was always struggling for finances, so he was always thinking ahead and always thinking about what's going to create the funding for the next expedition. Both leaders knew success in this expedition would result in more clients the following season. And on May the 10th, most of Scott Fisher's clients made the summit before Rob Hall's. It's a situation that may have persuaded Hall to carry on climbing with his clients past the turnaround time. Rob was looking at all of the Fisher Expedition members going to the summit. There's no question in my mind that there was an influencing force watching them go. The responsibility for turning the clients around ultimately rested with Scott Fisher and Rob Hall. So why did such experienced climbers fail to make the important decisions that might have saved lives? One possible answer can be found in the deadly effects of high altitude. Dr. Jeremy Windsor has devoted his professional life to the study of the effects of altitude on the human body and mind. In 2007, he was part of a research expedition to the summit of Everest, conducting groundbreaking experiments in the death zone. Everything that you encounter at 8,000 meters seems to be going against you. The oxygen is incredibly thin. There's just a third of the oxygen available at 8,000 meters than what you'd find at sea level. This is a place where the human body isn't designed to survive. Climbers suffer a rapid deterioration of bodily functions, a condition known as hypoxia. Retinas can hemorrhage. The heart rate increases and arteries constrict. It also seriously impairs mental function. Whether it's your short-term or long-term memory, 
your concentration span, your ability to arrange shapes or to list numbers or spell words, any simple neurological test, they all come out as being impaired at altitude. They're just flickers of thoughts, half-finished words and vague ideas just floating through your mind. In the death zone, the decision-making capacity of all the climbers would have been severely diminished. But reports from the mountain suggest that Scott Fisher was suffering more than most. Scott was definitely not the Scott that I knew on that particular day. Throughout May the 10th, he'd repeatedly said he was sick and exhausted and was seen stumbling. This could be evidence that Scott was suffering from something more serious than hypoxia. High altitude cerebral edema, or HACE. HACE affects between one in a hundred and one in a thousand people who spend time above 5,000 meters. Fluid accumulates in the brain and that brain then will start to swell. Then we start to see the neurological symptoms. The poor sense of coordination and an imbalance of movement. This can deteriorate into a loss of consciousness and eventually it can prove fatal. Scott Fisher was found with his thermal suit unzipped and his head Sherpa Lopsang reported that he'd been talking irrationally. He wanted to untie from his harness and jump off the ridge or some such thing. I mean, things that normal climbers don't say. So perhaps this is an indication that he had haste. He also requested a helicopter rescue, despite knowing that because of the thin air, no helicopter had ever landed higher than base camp. For a man of his skills and talents, to ask for a helicopter rescue clearly reflects that he was in a terrible state in those last few hours when he was with Lopsang. The shortage of oxygen in the atmosphere was to have another effect on perhaps the strongest climber summiting Everest that day. Anatoly Bukriev was a Russian climber from the old school. Scott wanted Anatoly to be the troubleshooter, the one who was always in the lead in the most difficult situations, and to uh, save Scott's ass if somebody really went bad. Bukriev had chosen to climb Everest without the assistance of supplementary oxygen. Bottled oxygen keeps you warmer, you're probably making better decisions, you've got more oxygen for your brain, obviously. What the clients want from the guide is the marginal difference in strength and experience and awareness above their own abilities to keep them safe and to help them out. And if you choose to not climb with oxygen and your client is, you're giving back most, if not all, of that marginal safety. Lack of oxygen meant Bukriev was unable to stay on the summit for long. His help during the descent could have made a critical difference. I wish that Anatoly had stayed with us and not descended on his own. Perhaps we would have been able to get back to the camp before the storm came. But one thing is certain. Once the storm struck, Bukriev was a lifesaver. Anatoly did make a very heroic effort to go back out there and save many lives. What he did at that point was superhuman. One of the most important messages that's come out of the disaster in 96 is that guides and Sherpas on the mountain must be wearing supplemental oxygen. Today, oxygen is compulsory for guides on Everest. Now, 
it's possible to rewind the events of that fatal day to reveal how so many experienced climbers lost their lives on Everest. May the 9th, 1996. 19 hours to disaster. Two expeditions set off from Camp 4. 33 climbers are attempting to summit. Seven hours to disaster. They reach the south summit. The expected fixed ropes are not there. A bottleneck forms. Six hours to disaster. The first climber summits. He descends an hour after the turnaround time. Three hours to disaster. Leader Scott Fisher arrives at the summit after the rest of his group. Two hours to disaster. Scott Fisher falls ill. Rob Hall struggles with an unconscious climber. Seconds to disaster. 11 climbers just meters from Camp 4 are hit by a deadly storm. At this point, for some, there is no hope. Despite all the errors and miscalculations, it's possible that many of the climbers would have survived the night if it hadn't been for the severity of the storm that struck during their descent. Gusts of up to 80 miles an hour ripped into the mountainside. Temperatures plunged to minus 40. But there was another lesser known effect of the changing conditions. In the storm of 96, the barometric pressure fell. As a result, the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere fell. It's been calculated that the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere may have dropped by up to 14% as the storm swept in, at a time when they had all run out of supplementary oxygen. There was a real step. They fell off that physiological knife edge. For a group who'd spent 24 hours on the mountainside, already starved of oxygen, this drop made all the difference. It's that very knife edge that makes climbing Everest such a deadly undertaking. A successful summit bid is dependent not only on careful planning. Whenever you climb Everest, you need that perfect weather window. You need everything in your favor. You need the wind speeds to be low, the air temperatures to be warm, and the sky to be clear. Mountain Madness believes that the guiding industry is made up of a community of like-minded individuals that work cooperatively on the mountains. In this instance, it could be argued that competitiveness between guiding companies may have led to mistakes. But it was ultimately Mother Nature that ruled the day. Today, weather forecasts are more accurate. The hardest sections are roped well ahead of time. Important decisions are made at base camp rather than at altitude. And guides must use oxygen. But dangers remain. I think there's kind of a misconception of that if we really analyze everything into the slightest detail, then people will stop dying on Everest. Dream on. It's never going to be risk-free climbing Everest. If you want to be safe, don't climb mountains. Don't go in the first place.